Thanks for coming, everybody. Nicholas Nassim Taleb has devoted his life to problems of uncertainty, probability, and knowledge. He spent two decades as a trader bec before becoming a philosophical essayist and academic researcher. Although he now spends most of the time either working in intense seclusion in his study or as a flaneur, I love that word, meditating in cafes across the planet, he is currently distinguished professor of risk engineering at New York University's Polytechnic Institute. His main subject matter is decision making under opacity. That is, a map and a protocol on how we should live in a world we don't understand. Uh, we'll be selling books after the, the talk, and Mr. Uh, Taleb will sign them for you. He's going to pause for questions occasionally during the talk as well as after, but please go to the mic if you want to ask a question. Okay, please welcome Nicholas Nassim Taleb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's actually the first time I uh, speak at a place uh, knowing what it's about because I, I, I've watched your Google Talks on YouTube and, uh, and they're, uh, they're, they're quite interesting because they're long. No, they're one hour, which means we have like an hour and ten minutes, is that it? Because there's always a bonus that the speaker likes to give himself. Anyway, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, an author should not uh, give you a substitute for his book. A book should, is a different product. It's not a talk. So in other words, it's not something that you can substitute. So what I'm going to do is mostly what I have here as slides is, is uh, things to scare you a little bit. It's just graphs, things that are not, cannot be captured um, in, in, in a, a fully in a verbal conversation. And I'm going to show you graphs what is this idea of anti-fragile about. So, but, so I will speak for about, what, 20, 25 minutes, which means probably 30. And then we're going to have a Q&A. But if you're extremely angry with what I have to say, do not hesitate and interrupt. Raise your hand. And uh, if you if you're have severe uh, disagreements, disagreements are always very good. This is why these things should be different from the book, because with the book, the author rarely disagrees with himself, you see, <laughs> whereas here you can have disagreements and they're welcome. Okay, so we start. When you ask, if you ask your uh, mother or cousins, someone who hasn't heard about this uh, book, what's the opposite of fragile, what do you think the answer would be? Robust, what else? Stout. Durable, solid, adaptable, resilient, what else? Okay, it's not, all right? Simply because if you're sending, if, uh, let's look at the exact mathematical opposite. I don't know, you guys uh, work for Google. What's the opposite of negative uh, here? Positive, okay, it's not neutral. Okay, very good. So what's the opposite of convex? Concave, actually the negative of convex is concave, you see? Very good. So the opposite of robust cannot possibly be, ro uh, the opposite of uh, fragile cannot possibly be robust. If I'm sending a package to southwestern Siberia, all right, and uh, it has a, it's a wedding, and you're sending a wedding gift, so you have champagne flutes. What do you write on a package? Fragile, and underneath, to explain it to the Russian inspector, what do you say? Handle with care, all right? Okay. So what is the opposite of handle with care? If you're going to send the exact opposite package, what would you, what would you write on it? Yeah, exactly. Please mishandle. So something that is fragile, if you map it properly mathematically, you realize that the fragile is what does not like disorder. It doesn't want mishandling. It doesn't want volatility. It wants peace and predictability. So the opposite of that would be something that loves volatility. What I'm saying may sound interesting and new, but it's not to the option traders I worked with, because I was an option trader for 20 years before becoming uh, whatever, calling myself whatever, all these names, all right? I was just a simple option trader before. But my publishers now, you know, they, they want to hide it. But uh, the, the fact is, and option traders, they, have, they understand the world of you in two different dimensions. The things that don't like volatility and things that like volatility. 
and it's very, very extremely bipolar view of the world. Okay? You, you don't have, almost have nothing in between. And effectively, all I did is generalize this idea to map it you know, to things that option traders, because option traders, all they do is they, they, they drink and they trade options, all right? <laughs> so they don't have exposure outside of that narrow field. So all I'm doing is representing them to take the idea outside. And we can do a lot of things because effectively, fragility is something I can measure and anti-fragility is something I can measure. But risk, you can't really measure unless, of course, you, you know, you, you're at Harvard or Stanford or one of these places where they have the illusion of they can measure risk. But in reality, we can't measure risk. It's something in the future. I can measure fragility. And let's see how we can generalize. The graph you have here shows you very simply a fragile payoff, where nothing happens most of the time. You, I, I don't know. You don't have porcelain cups here. Otherwise, we've had an experiment. But nothing happens most of the time. But when something happens, it's negative, you see? So this is a fragile. You can, everything fragile has this property. You can, to give you a hint, we can uh, generalize it to medicine, where you take pills where, that give you very small benefits. The benefits are small or non-existent. And the harm is large and rare, and often not seen in the past history of the product. That's a fragile. So I take a pill, gives me small benefits, and then 10 years later, you realize that it gave you cancer or some hidden disease that nobody saw. Same payoff, the fragile, OK? Visibly, the, anti the robust will have this payoff. It doesn't care. And the anti-fragile will have, sorry, the anti-fragile will have this payoff where harm is small, and the big variations are positive, are favorable. So this is sort of like the idea, the general idea. It's, it's, it's once you link fragility to volatility, you can do a lot of things. And let me show you exactly the link. I'm going to show you a graph that sort of explains it in graphical terms. Everything fragile has to have disproportionate harm. In other words, concave, nonlinear. I'll show you. We'll talk about concave in a few minutes. Nonlinear harm with respect to an event size. Let me explain. I, don't, I mean, you guys at Google, and particularly in this part of California, it's pretty special. But if you jump 10 meters, that's 33 feet. I guess people here in Palo Alto in this area, they die, no? Very good, no? They would die, all right. Now, if you jump 100 times 10 centimeters, you survive, no? OK. Every, OK, you, it means your exposure is not linear to harm. You're harmed a lot more jumping 10 feet than if you jump 10 times one foot. You see, so you have acceleration of harm. If I smash one of the Maseratis you see in Palo Alto against the wall at 100 miles per hour, I'm going to damage it a lot more than if I smash it 100 times at one mile per hour. Do you agree? So you have, it means that there is disproportionate harm coming an acceleration of harm. It's a second uh, uh, order effect. Fragility is in a second order effect. And it has to be so. Because if harm were not linear, were linear, I'd be harmed just walking to the office. You see? Th this is the central idea. Anything that has survived and is in existence today is harmed a lot more by a 10%, say, move in the market, 10% uh, 10 meter jump or whatever it is, then by a tenth of that, then 10 times a tenth of that. It means it has to be concave to a source of stressor. In, in my book, I, I give the, uh, because in, in my book, I don't have these, uh, this is, this talk is more sophisticated than the book, or the contents of the book. In the book, I have to, you know, give a story, and it's in uh, the Talmudic uh, uh, literature that there is a king who had to punish his son, and he had to, uh, crush him with a big stone. And given that he was both a king and a father, he had a dilemma till it was solved by a local counselor who told him it's very simple, crush the big stone in pebbles and, and, and then throw pebbles at him. That's the definition of fragility. Anything that survived 
conditional on something having survived, it has to be harmed disproportionately. You see, the larger the stone, the more the harm. With this, you can see why large is, becomes vulnerable to shocks because, for example, a 100 million pound project in the United Kingdom where we have data has 30% more cost overruns than a 5 million pound project, you see? So this is, now with this, not only we have a definition of fragility, but we have a robust way to measure it. How? Simple. I cannot, it's the acceleration that allows me to detect the fragility, the acceleration of harm. If I have a bad ruler, I can't measure a child, the height of a child, do you agree? It's very hard, but I can, but I can tell how fast he's growing in percentage, you agree? So I don't have to have a great measuring tool for fragility. All I need is to detect the second order derivative, the acceleration, because fragility is in acceleration. Now that I gave you the difficult stuff, let me talk about my book. Everything reposes on this idea that, we can, that fragility is in a concave. And if I learn how to work this, hold on, this, uh, this is a concave. The concave is fragile, and you can see the benefits, all right? <laughs> and the concave is anti-fragile. To give you an idea why the concave is fragile, your grandmother, if you have a piece of information that your grandmother spent two days at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you, you, you know, as sole information, you would assume that your grandmother is very happy, no? That's the perfect temperature for grandmothers. But if as a sec then the second order, ah, your grandmother spent the first day at zero degrees and the second one at 140 degrees for an average of 70 degrees. I think you would be thinking about the inheritance and all the things that come with funeral, no? Okay, so is fragile what does not like a negative second order effect and is therefore anti-fragile what likes variation and likes these second order effects. Let me try to work this because I'm a little confused about this. My, how to work the computer, okay. Uh, the, figured out how to work it. So let's stop with the graphs and let me talk about the book. Now you're confused enough but intrigued. So let me talk about my book after I showed you these technical definitions. Well, this book, I realized well, the, 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 that this property of anti-fragility, once you have definition of fragility, then you have this opposite, was misunderstood in the discourse. Like when governments want stability, they shoot for perfect stability, but something that is organic requires some amount of volatility. It's the exact opposite of the grandmother. There's a mathematical property called Jensen's inequality that tells you that often things gain under variability. There are a huge amount of phenomena like that. In other words, you do a lot better yourself if you spend an hour at 50 degrees and an hour at uh, 80 degrees than if you spend two hours at uh, 65 degrees, for example. That Jensen's inequality, anything convex, actually this is a graph of Jensen's inequality. Okay, here it is, okay. It's complicated, I told you, all right? So let me remove it very quickly. So. <laughs> There are things that like uh, variation. So you can classify things in three categories. The fragile is what does not like volatility, randomness, variability, uncertainty, stressors. The robust doesn't really care, like the book and bridge. And the anti-fragile requires some amount of variability in all of these. The discourse missed completely the notion of anti-fragile. So we try to get stability with government, for example. They want to have no fluctuation, and you saw what Greenspan did. If you gave him the seasons, he would have had the seasons at 67.8 degrees, <laughs> the temperature year-round, like inside this office. That's what you maintain, I think, all right? Inside the office, and of course, you know, we've blown up the planet. I'm glad we only gave him the economy. He only blew, up, blew that up, okay? But we do a lot of harm by depriving something organic of a certain amount of variability. Anything organic, communicates with this environment via stressors. So this is composed of uh, seven books. Book one, I talk about this difference between a cat and a washing machine. In other words, between the organic that requires stressors. I don't know, you guys have a gym at Google? 
Well, there you go. So you put your body under stress. But you don't realize there are other things you need to put under stress as well. There are other stresses you need to have just to enjoy life, if you want to be alive. There's no liquid I know of that tastes better than a glass of water after spending some time in the Sahara Desert, you see? So therefore, there is transcendent inequality at work right there in your life, you see? So the, the, we're missing on, we realize here and there that you need to stress the bones, but we don't really transfer to other areas of life. Like, uh, we may not like to have you know this architecture, modernistic architecture, smooth architecture? It's not as pleasant, it's not for us, as something richer, fractal. I'm looking out the window, I have trees. A lot richer. And the, the ancients actually liked that. I don't know if you've been in a Gaudi building in, in Barcelona, where you walk in, you feel like it's a cave. It's rich in details, and I feel more comfortable. Well, visibly, my eye likes variations, just like your body likes some thermal variation and some stressors, OK? So that's book one where I talk about that, and I talk about ethics. What happens is that people understand that what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. But they don't understand the real logic of it, which is that what kills me makes others stronger. That in fact, a system that works very well is a system that has layers. Like the restaurant business works very well because its components are fragile. The, the entrepreneurship, otherwise would be eating bad food. Or, I mean, not that we're eating great food all the time, but you understand the idea, all right? Uh, you'd be eating like uh, Russia during the Soviet uh, era. So there's some b businesses thrive, like California, I'm here at the epicenter of things, that thrive because of the failure rate is converted into benefits for the system. So to, this is Darwinistic except that we can inject some ethics into it to avoid what philosophers call the, na the naturalistic fallacy, that what is natural isn't necessarily great. So we can have, we should have entrepreneurs encourage them, you know, more entrepreneurs in the economy, encourage them to fail, and remove the stigma. So it's the only place in, 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 in the world where there's no big stigma for failure. Here in California, we should have it more generalized because you need them. But also at the biological level, when you starve yourself, you stress some cells. And the reason we are, you know, we, 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 can be health, we are healthy is because there are fragile cells in us that break first under stress. So, and and, and, and they, therefore, we, you have an improvement in, within you. So you always have the top layer requires the fragility of the lower layer. So that's book one. Book two, again, these books are separate books that discuss different topics linked to that original idea that I gave you. Book two is about modernity, how suddenly we start having policies to try to control, uh, you know, uh, touristify the world, where you have a plan, you have everything, everything is smooth, no randomness in life. And I explained that really we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, people have discovered over time that you need randomness to stabilize a lot of systems. So the, the book discusses a disease called interventionism, over-stabilizing systems, and some research on different areas, about 50 of them, that where in which there is a, a need for randomness to stabilize systems. Like uh, uh, Maxwell's governor, you know, it, it's, uh, it was discovered that if you over-stabilize a steam engine, it blows up. But so you have that in the economy, you have that in a lot of places. So that's my book too, and I thought discuss a certain brand of persons I call the fragilista, someone who denies the anti-fragility of thing and fragilizes by, uh, by that denial. And, and this will, later on, we'll talk about the relative of the fragilista, with the Soviet Harvard approach to things from top down, not bottom up. So that's book two. Book three introduces a friend of mine, Fat Tony. All right? And Fat Tony is, doesn't like predictions. And he, he, visibly, as his name indicates, he enjoys life. And, uh, but he's not, he's a little coarse. And then he's, there's his friend Nero, he and Nero are always fighting. But he taught Nero how to smell fragility. Because you see these graphs, I had to use my brain to understand fragility. Fat Tony can do it naturally. He can figure out the sucker, all right? So his idea of the world is sucker versus non-sucker. And his, his, his point is that any system that's based on prediction is gonna blow up. So he finds those who really are sensitive to prediction error 
because re remember, the fragile is very sensitive to prediction error. So and then I continue, book four, I, I don't know if I have the book numbers right, but it, you know, it's okay, I, I can change it because I'm the author, remember, right? Uh, book four is about, uh, ah, okay, book four is about optionality and things I introduce um, linked to convexity. I haven't given, talk, you know, I don't want to scare the readers. I didn't talk to them about convexity right away. I tried to get through the back door via this uh, very simple uh, representation. Is if you have an asymmetric payoff, if you make more when you're right than you lose when you're wrong, all right, then you are anti-fragile. And if you have more to lose than to gain, you are fragile. Same applies to coffee cup, to anything, to China, anything, all right? And of course, the volatility will be the vector, you know, that will cause you to lose. So the, I introduced this, but instead of, so far the book is not technical, so I, I introduced it via Fat Tony and then Seneca. Seneca also was, was uh, like Fat Tony, but much uh, more intellectual. Seneca, the, Greek, the Roman philosopher, who's precisely not Greek in the sense that he was practical and he had a practical approach to stoical philosophy. The guy was the wealthiest man in the world. And he was obsessed with the fact that when you're very wealthy, you have more to lose than to gain from wealth. So he trained himself every day to wake up thinking he's poor and then rediscover wealth. Or, and once in a while, he would get on a, on a uh, he would mimic like he would, uh, he would have a uh, shipwreck in which he writes that he only, he, he like lives as if he were on a shipwreck with only one or two slaves, right? <laughs> you get it, so that was his, uh, but he was the wealthiest man in the world writing about how to love poverty. You get the idea, but he, the guy was good at it. He figured out that you have to always be in a situation where you got more upside than downside. And then you don't have to worry about randomness. And in fact, the strangest thing is not that he said it, picked it up in him, I was shocked. I said, this guy is talking like normal people. With all academics, the view of, uh, of stoicism is that they'd be like academics, all right? Boring and like vegetables. Stoicism unmoved by the world. No, they're only unmoved by bad events. That's central. So via Seneca, I introduced that notion of asymmetry. Always have more downside, more upside than downside from random events, and then you're anti-fragile. So, I go through Fat Tony and Seneca to drill the point, and it sort of works. Also, this book has titles and subtitles, and there's no connection between the title, the subtitles, and the text. All right? <laughs> so why? Because I wanted, since, since I wrote my first book, I sort of I was afraid of reviewers. But then I said the best way to have a book is to tick off reviewers from day one. So that way I don't have to fear them. And, there's, and reviewers, they want to skim a book. They can't understand, figure out what it is about. <laughs> Plus, I put 600 pages of a map. Actually, it's a Google uh, text, by the way. You guys are warehousing it for, for free. So far, it's 400 pages of math, dense math, as backup for this, plus a technical appendix. So the, uh, so the, the you know, just to tick off reviewers, so the, the, the idea is that I want people to go through the reading experience. So they can't figure out by then that I'm talking about the whole thing, book is about transcendent inequality, all right? Things that love randomness and how to benefit from it. Now I'm gonna go to California and talk to you guys about a phenomenon. I, I skipped the chapters because here I have more Greek philosophers, more stories. Something very simple. I'm gonna simulate a process here. This is not in a book, by the way, all right? This is outside the book. Simulate the process where you have two people competing. One person has knowledge, and his brother has, um, has a convexity, has a convex payoff. Look at, and the difference between them would be, the difference between knowledge and a convex payoff will be what I call the convexity bias. I simulated it, and look how big it is. Well, visibly, this explains something. <laughs> that people so far couldn't understand. You know, trial and error, okay, has errors in it, do you agree? So in, in, in history books, uh, history of technology, people usually oppose trial and error versus theoretical knowledge. But they never were able to work with trial and error. They didn't understand it was, had to be convex. Trial and error relies on luck, but luck can hurt you. 
So it was never modeled as an option. Technology as an option. If it's modeled as an option, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, so I'll, leave, I'll, I'll go over this uh, very quickly. If I were to model it as an option, trial and error, then it would, have, it would be something that loves volatility. You see? Option loves volatility. And you, you can have policies that come from it. My idea of Flanner is very simple. When, I'd much rather have series of options, like have a long highway with a lot of exits, than be locked in into top-down plan, like a highway with no exits. A destination, you exit. That's it. So assume you want to change your mind, you're in trouble. Okay. Particularly if you don't know Russian and you're in Russia, right? That's how they build their thing. So, the, 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 so you have two approaches to knowledge. One is top-down and one is bottom-up. So here there are about 75 pages that should upset a lot of academics because you take, I, I took some you know, uh, evidence, which includes my own field, which was to be derivatives, that a lot of things that we, think, we believe come from top-down knowledge and theoretical knowledge effectively come from tinkering dressed up later as having been developed by a theoretician, which includes these corners up here, Euclid. People say you have to learn Euclidean geometry and look at all these things that were built after Euclid, all right, for about 15th, 16th century. People were building things that never heard who Euclid was, all right? And the Romans were extremely heuristic, very, very, very um, experience-based, and they did everything using this convex knowledge. How is convex knowledge? It's exactly like cooking. You have very little to lose by adding an ingredient and tasting. All right? If it works, now you have a better recipe. If it fails, you lost nothing. So things in knowledge, no, no academic would want to, ex I mean, I'm a professor in an engineering department. No academic, except engineers, because they're nice people, no academic would accept the notion <laughs> that knowledge can come from a uh, uh, bottom-up, uh, you know. So we have evidence of what I call lecturing birds how to fly. A lot of science comes from technology. But look at the definition. Google technology science, and we explain that technology is application of science to practical things, exactly opposite. Anyway, so this is my, my option theory thing. I don't know if it upset many of you, but typically it upsets academic. So then I go to the notion of medicine. To get to it, I go uh, to something called via negativa. How to make something robust? To make something robust, there are two things. Because of Jensen's inequality, it's better to, run, better to uh, walk and sprint rather than just jog. So you have uh, uh, strategies that are, uh, uh, have variations in them. Bipolar strategies are vastly better than uh, mono you know, strategies. Uh, and, and you see it, for example, uh, in, uh, it, with portfolios, it's much better to put 80% of your money risk-free if you can find something like that, and 20% speculative, rather than uh, the whole thing medium risk. Much more robust that way. But you can see it in the policy of uh, every single mono monogamous species, which includes humans, but, but, but you, we, know we have data for birds. Monogamous birds, typically, instead of the female opting for a good match, she's she picks the accountant 90% of the time and the rock star to cheat with 10% of the time for a linear combination of having someone in the middle, you see? So the, the idea, you take the loser but stable accountant and something like that, uh, that accountants are losers, but you, you see the kind, all right? And, and then you take, and then you have the hot shot rock star on, on the occasion. So the linear combination is better. This is explained in the book, why things that have variation and, and I use the same, the very same equation of Jensen's equality to show why it's a lot more stable. So, and uh, then medicine, of course. This is medicine, where you have visible gains from anything uh, you know you ingest in medicine and big losses. Except there is convexity in medicine, and. and uh, uh, the, 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 we, I study uh, uh, you know the problems of. of uh, harm done by the healer, whether in policy or, or, or something else, in medical terms, uh, it's called iatrogenics. Harm given to you by someone who's supposed to help you. And you can measure iatrogenics probabilistically. I'm going to give you an idea that I just put on a web today. That's not exactly in a book, but what we discovered from something about blood pressure. In so you have these big hidden risks. But if you look at 
Mother Nature, okay, Mother Nature equipped us for a lot of natural, I mean, three billion years is a lot of time, okay, even for uh, Google, you see. So it's a lot of time. So Mother Nature was capable of treating things that are, don't deviate from the normal. So if you, we have never been able to find anything you can put in your system that has turned out to be 20 years later unconditionally good without a hidden risk like this. Steroids, taxaminophen, all these. You see, small little gains. But on the other hand, we should analyze medicine using convexity terms. That if you are very ill, you should have a lot more medicine and much less medicine if you're not very ill. There's convexity of payoff from medical treatment. But there is a problem, and let me give you the problem. If you're mildly hypertensive and they give you drugs, you have one chance in 53 of, uh, of, of benefiting from it. But now you have all these risks. If you're extremely hypertensive, you have 90, 80% chance of benefiting from the drug. So you have this risk, but you have also huge benefit, particularly when you're very ill. But the problem is as follows. People who are one sigma away from the mean, which nature has treated, okay, by the way, all right, and medicine doesn't help them much, are five times more numerous than people four sigma away from the mean, you see? So if you're pharma, what would you do? Who would you treat? You see, you have five times more people mildly ill than people very ill. What would you do? You'd focus on the mildly ill. I would focus on reclassifying people as mildly ill. You agree? To be treatable. And also, they don't die, so they're repeat clients. You're going to catch them for a long time. <laughs> so I use this argument against uh, pharma. Via negativa is by removal of something unnatural to us. You, you, you have no side effects, no long-term side effects. In a complex system, you need something I call less is more, because adding something has multiplicative side effects, whereas removing something unnatural, like if I stop you from smoking or something like that, you have very, very small long-term side effects. So that's, these are the books so far. And then book number, uh, the last one, seven, is on ethics. And it's very simple. It's about situation in which one person makes the upside and someone else makes the downside. You're looking at me like, what was he talking about? Have you heard of banks? Bankers make the upside, the rest of society has the downside, all right? So they're long volatility at the expense of others. And, and of course, it's my most emotional book and the one that made me the most enemies because I name names. I have this thing. When you see a fraud, say fraud. Otherwise, you're a fraud. So, uh, you know, commitment to ethics. And, uh, and, and the whole book is about, uh, uh, you know, of course, never ask a doctor what you should do. You get a completely different answer if you ask him what he would do if you were you, all right? So here, I don't give advice. I just tell people what I've done, what I do. Like when someone asks me for forecast, I don't believe in forecast. I tell, you, I tell you, this is what I've done, or this is what I have in my portfolio today. Go look at it, if I want. Otherwise, but no forecast. The same thing is that you should never take, have, harm others with a mistake. Why this is central? Because at no time in history have we had more people harm others without paying the price. Whether bureaucrats in Washington, they're not harmed, shamed by a spreadsheet, to economists giving us bogus methods, and academics are not harmed, you know, are not the one bearing the harm. So nothing improves in that field. So they Steve Kill telling you, oh, it's peer reviewed by a great journal. Nonsense, all that's nonsense. <laughs> they're, not, they're not harmed by the mistake, so we can keep going on with all this uh, uh, can you say, uh, can you curse here? Uh, with all this bullshit, all right, you can edit to that, all right. So, I mean, I don't know, I, I did that at LSE, I used the F word at LSE, and then they told me, well, you know what, uh, we're gonna keep it, but it's extremely unusual, so I told them, okay. Uh, but um, anyway, during the Q&A, probably I can relax more and, and that's all right. So here I've introduced the book, and I end the book with the following. The only way you know you're alive, you're not a machine, is if you like variability. That's it. So this is it. If you're anti-fragile, it means you're alive. So thank you for listening to me. And now let's start the Q&A.
I, I, keep the, I keep the slides just in case uh, someone asks me an uh, emotional question. And, you know, <laughs> and then, OK, go ahead. Hi, th thanks for coming. It was great to hear you speak. I was wondering um, if you could elaborate on a related topic of fragility, which is uh, this whole question of uh, a long piece. Uh, OK, very good. Excellent, your... excellent. Okay. What has happened over the past uh, 200 years and, and, and in, 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 in the military is that uh, you have switched to tougher weapons, okay? So these, you know, so we had longer periods of peace punctuated with, with war. And, and if you stood in 1913 and three quarters looking at recent history, you'd say, oh, it's all quiet now. We don't have to worry. I'm sure you wouldn't surprise. Uh, so th when we move into what I call black swan prone variables, it takes much longer to figure out what's going on. And, and we live in that world of, uh, you know, where more, most of the, the big jumps come from a small number of variables. You guys here prove it, okay? If you look at how much of the internet traffic is explained by Google, you have that concentration. You see, if you look in a book business where you have 0.2% of the author generate half the income, so you realize you have that concentration. So the same applies to wars. Simply, this is with fat tail processes, you cannot make an inference from just a small sample. And a lot of people make a mistake of taking the last 50 years, say nothing happened the last 50 years, therefore let's not worry. No, we have a lot of potential danger. Plus, the, it's, if it's a Pinker book, the Pinker book uh, is confused. But that's, other than that, I mean, it's nice. Uh, you, yeah, crime has dropped, but, uh, but you, you can't make statements about whether uh, the risks have changed and their I've written about it on the web. I don't want to talk about it. I got emotional. Thanks. So, <laughs> next question. In, when you were describing chapter one, I think it was, you said that what doesn't kill me makes others stronger. Uh, book one, yeah. Book, book one. one. What doesn't kill me, what kills me makes others stronger. Right. What kills me makes others stronger. But one of the takeaways I got from your Black Swan book was that it's a, that's a fallacy, that if you look at a population and you stress it, and that's the, excellent. Weak, yeah. the weak ones die out, you're left with the strong ones, but he, it's not really true that the stress caused the strength. Exactly. Well, what he, what, it's the same point I'm making, right? The, the, the people think that what kills me, what didn't kill me makes me stronger, and I'm saying it's wrong. It's typically because there's, it's a selection effect, not a, a, an improvement. Let me go through the history of the mistakes made with anti-fragility. There's something in medicine called hormesis. You give someone a drug, their body overcompensates by getting stronger. A gentleman wrote something on antifragility, all right, from a draft I had. He's a geneticist, and he actually proved that it, what happens is that if the system gets stronger, it's because some of the components were destroyed. So when someone says, what, what killed me what, what, what didn't kill me made me stronger. It could often be that it killed the others who were weaker. And therefore, I had the illusion of getting stronger when, in fact, it killed the others who are weaker. You see? That, that's the idea. It's, it's a little subtle idea which tells you that everything is by layers. I have cells. The cells have protein in them and all that. And typically, the weak needs to always be destroyed to improve, for the system to improve. And this is how your, your body improves, not because it overall improves under shock. It's because you're killing things that are bad, typically. Thank you, Professor Taleb. Um, I think that your message about our epistemic limitation is very important. And I had a question about your uh, view of the libertarian movement and how do you think that uh, your idea of anti-fragility fits into the ideas of smaller government and more bottom-up uh, approaches? That, that's excellent. So, so what I'm showing uh, here is actually, is, I don't know if it's a libertarian view, but it's definitely a localist view. Or in favor of city states are a lot more robust because of the side effect. A, a small government works better, not because it's small government, but because it's low, you get the idea. No, it's small top, top down government doesn't work. Now, you can have probably a dictatorship in, in a small village, and it may work. So what I, I, I cannot prove that that it's not private versus uh, public. It, for me, it's large versus small. Small has uh, uh, the ability to survive, and the large gets disproportionately weakened by, um, by uh, unexpected events. And thanks for linking it to epistemic uh, opacity, because this idea of fragility being measurable solves the problem of opacity. I don't understand the environment, but I can 
pretty much figure out if I'm fragile to it. Go ahead. So you said you didn't believe in forecasts, so I, I won't ask you to make a forecast. So uh, what's in your portfolio? Uh, okay, I, I'm not, uh, no, I don't want to enter these details, but, but I can talk, I mean, because I'm talking about my book and in a year it will change, right? So I, I, I can't talk about that, but I, I'm, I would give that, uh, I, I, I'll tell you that if I were compelled to produce a forecast, but I, I don't like the forecast. <laughs> but anyway, the book tells you what I do, all right? So that's what I do, and, and it irritates the critics. Everything that irritates book critics is wonderful for books. So, but again, consider this class of phenomena that benefit from harm. Rumors love repression. Try to repress a rumor and see what, 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 what we'll do. Okay, go stand up and deny a rumor. And see what, when the politician says, you know, we will not devalue, the rumor is wrong. You know, it happens. You know, the, the, the best way for rumor to spread. And uh, same thing with books. Try to ban them and see what happens. Uh, a lot of things, uh, uh, there's a cl some class of, I call it, uh, uh, what do I call it, uh, refractory love, where people try, like uh, in Proust, where people have obsessive love, and the more you try to repress it, the, the stronger it gets. A lot of things get stronger under repression and belong to that class of anti-fragile, and they all can be mapped as convex. Yes, go ahead. Some of the systems that you mentioned, uh, the difference of that, I'm just trying to compare that to the financial markets, is you know if you get a if you have a period of stability and all of a sudden you get cancer you usually don't recover back yourself or if you have a fragile item it breaks down it usually doesn't recover itself but how would you compare that to financial markets doesn't okay. have extra let property me, uh, that, you know. okay let, let me let me link this to the question earlier because now I remember uh, you know that I didn't get full answer to the question earlier a system that has a lot of parts independent that break sequentially and none is going to improve how Take, for example, transportation or take engineering. Every bridge that collapses makes every other bridge in the country safer. You see, so the probability of a, of a, of a, you know, a building that collapses makes every building in the country, all right, the probability of the next building collapsing smaller, okay? Smaller or equal, but not, doesn't get worse. So when you have a system composed of small units that break sequentially, fail, fail in, in, uh, you know, without contagion effects, the system improves from failure. And exactly this is what kills me made other uh, stronger. Uh, and that's a benign system or a system that's uh, actually anti-fragile. Now, take banking, take large corporations. When one fails, the other, it, it increases the probability of the other failing. Then the system doesn't work well. That's one thing to answer him and get into your point. He's asking me whether financial markets, what benefits they have. Well, people think that they're good at providing information. In fact, they're great at masking information, and that's why it works, you see. Uh, the, the, it, it prevents panics. Say if someone is predictable and comes home every day at 5.30, boom, you can set your watch. He walked in. And one day he's late. What would happen? Two minutes and everybody freaks out, he's not here. Whereas someone a little more random in his arrival time will not cause a panic. Well, it's the same thing with prices. That's one of the aspects. Another thing with prices is that the volatility prevents big collapses because it's just like a forest. You have flammable material, steady small forest fires. Clean up that flammable material. Don't let it accumulate. But what happened was uh, Greenspan, by stabilizing everything, no volatility or minimized volatility, something they call the great moderation, resembles the great peace. You had a lot of hidden risks in the system, very explosive, ready to explode. And effectively, you know, we saw what happened, they blew up. So this is where financial markets, by bringing volatility, clean up the system periodically. So that explains it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, the question I had was, how does your work reflect on how you think about conglomerates and family businesses, especially in the developing world, where there seems to be a high concentration of preservation and a model where they actually look for stability versus chasing I, the variation? This is a good question. I, I don't know much about, uh, uh, I looked at family data for businesses, and effectively, in uh, what we call today the OECD uh, countries, um, they have a uh, stay in power because they don't have, they have what I call skin in the game, as, among other things, and, and uh, uh, among other uh, qualities. Now, conglomerates, I have no idea, you see. 
Uh, I just like the conglomerate uh, I work for, namely the owner of my, my uh, the owner of, uh, of Random House, Bertelsmann, because they're not listed in the market. Okay. Now you, you know, al although I like market volatility, I don't like people to fit the company to the security analysts who don't understand hidden risk, and the stock market tends to push companies to hide risks in the tails because the security analysts don't have a good tool to analyze second order effects. Uh, go ahead. How much of the anti-fragility phenomena that you're talking about across systems is really about uh, evolutionary learning and that the, the two curves, knowledge versus, um, I forget what the other one was labeled, but it was the anti-fragile curve, uh, is really about two different forms of acquiring knowledge. One uh, is through, um, art, one is for acquiring articulate knowledge through articulate processes and the other one is for acquiring inarticulate knowledge, the, the uh, kind of knowledge that Hayek talks about, um, yeah, where uh, the system learns without the human beings necessarily being aware of what it learns. Um, it, it, that's a good question. He's asking me how much of the, you know, the two types of knowledge, techne episteme, you see, uh, knowledge top down, bottom up, um, heuristic knowledge uh, versus, uh, you know, what we call propositional knowledge or, or things that, that are formalized. And so on. That, so there have the, uh, been a dichotomy through, through history between these two, you know, examines a lot of people. Uh, but the, fir the first person who discovered, uh, let me give you a little background, is Nietzsche. Nietzsche had in us a tension between, actually even Seneca discovered it, but, but, you know, but we attribute it to Nietzsche. When he was 25, he wrote the most beautiful book, probably, of, of the century, the, the, the verse of the tragedy, by showing tension in humans between the rational Apollonian in us and the deep, dark, unexplainable force, the Dionysian, Dionysian, Dionysian how, whatever, how it depends if you're British or American, how you pronounce it, from Dionysos, the god of wine and uh, the, 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 the evil thing. And he actually, Nietzsche is the one who used the word first, creative destruction. Okay. Nietzsche, not Schumpeter. An economist cannot come up with something that deep. Anyway, so <laughs> Nietzsche spoke about that. And to continue, he went after Socrates for saying, whatever you cannot explain isn't necessarily stupid. And effectively, in my book, Fat Tony has a debate with Socrates. You can imagine a guy from Brooklyn debating a Greek philosopher. And I let you guess who's going to win the debate along these lines. So effectively, I go along these lines, except that what I've done is very simple. I don't, make, I don't have a theory in here of anti-fragility, you know, people can talk about complex system, however they are. I have a descriptive detection. This here, I proved very simply that I can detect fragility through second order derivative. So in a way, what I have is more like phenomenology, which is not at the level of a theory, but something lower, a way to map objects in order to work with a world we don't understand. So in a way, I don't have a theory how things come from, but I, but, but I sort of integrated this dichotomy you have between the bottom-up, unexplainable, we don't know how we do it, with one thing I would like to mention, since we, there's time and not a question, one important thing, is that effectively, the longer you've been, we've been doing something that we don't understand, the longer we will do it. In the book, I say time is the only detector of fragility. Remember one thing, time is volatility. You agree? Time and volatility, mathematically, they all are the same. Disorder, time, entropy, volatility. Uh, approximately, I call them uh, siblings, brothers. They're not exactly the same, but they're like twin, uh, fraternal twin brothers. Okay? So with time, what was fragile eventually will break. So there's very simple law. Whatever is not perishable, namely an idea, will have a life expectancy that increases with time which is shocking for technologists, but, but let me explain the, the rationale. If you see a human and he's 40 years old, you can safely say, not knowing his history, okay, and he's not ill, unconditionally, that he has an extra uh, 50 years to go. You agree? That's mortality tables, conditional mortality table. He lives another year, okay? You know that his life expectancy has decreased by a little less than a year, you see? So his life expectancy decreases every day he, he lives. If I look at a technology, how old? All you need to know, how old? 40 days? Technology, a book, an idea, that are not perishable. 
Okay, our genes, for example, are not our bodies, all right? How old technology? 40 years, very good. It has 40 years to go. Next year, 41 years, at least 41 years to go. So life expectancy of technology increases every day, an idea of everything, believe it or not. So this is why we have bicycles, probably will, will live longer than, than cars, cars more than planes, all right? And of course, uh, you know, now we know that uh, the regular plane is better than supersonic planes, you see? And, and I'm talking about this here in Silicon Valley. Why? Well, very simply, because uh, uh, in, in uh, and we don't understand why. We don't have to understand anything. Time, there's an intelligence of time that's at work there. A book that had been in print for 3,000 years, uh, in print sort of like, or at least read for 3,000 years, uh, you know, that you get in hotel rooms still, all right, will probably be read for 3,000 years, okay? Regardless of what's the latest uh, intellectual will tell me about the rationality or not rationality. I don't believe in rationality. I believe in fragility, you see. So, the, uh, uh, and, and things like, and you, you apply it to technology. You can say the red car, the first red convertible car was born when? 30 eight and a half years ago, it has 38 years to go, you see, approximately. But of course, you'd be shocked now if you see how much of what we have today resembles ancient days. We still use watches, all right? Uh, glasses, 3,000 years old, uh, de uh, chairs, desks, um, silverware. Uh, we try to cook like our ancients did. And if you had in a book a picture of uh, a kitchen from Pompeii in Italy, uh, 2,000 year old, and it's no different from a good Italian restaurant's kitchen, all right? So this is to tell you that there are things we don't understand in the world, but we can understand them through, via, either, you know, not so, there's no rational means to understand why people use something, a life of technology, but we can understand them via just fragility, the concept of fragility, via time. Uh, so I'd like to ask a, I suppose not really, it's a separate question more than a follow-up, but um, returning to the uh, great debate between Hayek and Keynes, especially with regard to the Great Depression, uh, oversimplifying uh, the way I, I view it is that the Austrians were saying, that Hayek was saying, uh, okay, you've got this cascading failure, let it fail. Because systems that fail under cascading failure need to be beaten out of the system. It's the only way it's gonna learn. And it was, um, you know, and the, the basic Austrian point of view was uh, we're better off in the long run, which is the, the, this, the long run that Keynes was responding to. Uh, yeah, this I agree with because we're short of time, so I'm going to answer it very quickly. I see he's, he's comparing systems. Uh, I think that the, the, it's quite artificial to say Keynes versus Hayek. Keynes was not an idiot. I mean, he, to, he was a very smart uh, human. And he would think different, the, 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 vastly smarter than people who write for the New York Times and claim that Keynes said something. And then the other thing is, uh, and then also, of course, on the risks of the system. But I, I also have to say that the problem is you can't suddenly uh, stop doing things. If you look at medicine, okay, the rule is if you're slightly ill, let things take care of yourself. Because whatever medicine you're going to put in probably will harm you probabilistically a lot more than help you. But if you have cancer, you're very ill, see 10 doctors, not one, 10. You, you get the idea? So what happens with interventionism Okay, with statism intervention, over intervention, the, the state is never there. The interventionist is never there when really needed because of depleted resources. And this is what happened to us, by the way. <laughs> okay, the money's gone, all right? So it's a different problem. I, I don't know if I can claim with, with this thinking to be uh, fully against state intervention, but I would say if the state needs to intervene, it got to be with extreme circumstances and for very temporary situations to just avoid uh, pain, starvation, and stuff like that. If I use the same nonlinear argument, reducing extreme unhappiness is different from raising happiness. Two different animals. So we can take one more question, I guess. No? We have one. We have. We started at uh, three. So we have three minutes. No? So that's what I owe you. No? Right. Uh, when you talk about uh, finding fragility by just yes. looking at the second derivative, like, can you get some more details? Like the second. Derivative? Yes. It's very simple. You take a company, all right? You lower sales by 10%, they lose $100 million. You lower sales by an extra 10%, they lose $500 million. 
accelerating losses, okay, it means they're going to be a lot more harmed by, by, uh, by an adverse event than a regular company. Very simple test. It's so simple that, that people were ashamed of telling me I was right. You see, very simple, acceleration. Uh, take take, a, take a, the stock market, all right? The mar take a por portfolio. Market's down 5%, I lose a million. Market's down 10%, I lose 5 million. I'm fragile. That's simple. It's the same argument. Can you say that if the market goes up 10%, do I make more than if the market went down 10%? I'm anti-fragile. It's the same thing with, with a lot of situations. So debt brings fragility. You can measure it that way. Size causes fragility. You can measure it that way. Thanks.